with praise this morning so I'm just gonna count us off and can we just lift up our worship and our praise to our King this morning can we start off by praising him so on the count of three I just want us to lift up our praise to him lift up everything you have this morning one two three Lord we love you we worship you Jesus you're worthy God worthy of all the praise, Lord, this morning, and we honor you, Lord. We honor you, Jesus. We honor you, Jesus. You're worthy, Jesus. So we thank you, Lord. Woo! And we tell you to have your way, Jesus. Come and have your way in us, Lord. Have your way, we're here for Jesus. May all attention be on Jesus today. May 
May we love on him like we've never loved on him before. And saturate us, Lord. Rain on us this morning, Jesus, as we worship you, as we come to see the King of glory. We love you, God, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Can I hear an amen? You can put your hands together.
won't move. We're desperate, Lord, for a touch from you. If you don't come, we won't move. We're desperate. Sing it again. If you don't come. Desperate this morning for a touch from you. We're hungry this morning for a touch from you. We're longing this morning for a touch from you. We're hungry this morning for a touch from you. Jesus.
drinking to mask my emotions of being unhappy. But now I found God and no, I'm in a better place. I'm a better place. I'm happy. I feel the joy in my heart and I'm ready to, to receive God each and every day, God. Thank you for being here with me, everybody. Eight years I was walking with God. For the last year, I went prodigal. I cried out for God to take anything and anyone who did not belong in my life out, and he did. Every morning, I've been waking up praising him on my face. He never left. He's a good, good father. I'm just here so I don't get fined. <laughs> no, but seriously, I've been in church all my life, baptized at 16. Um, and God's been chasing me since then. Where I go, like Jonah was supposed to go to Nineveh, I ran the opposite direction for whatever assignments he put on me because I didn't want it. But I've come to a place where I'm tired of him chasing me and I'm ready to just walk with him. I am. <laughs> for the, the sake of my family, for those that I meet day to day, I'm ready to profess my faith. I'm ready to, to live the way that he's oh, called for yes. me to live so that we might save more souls for the kingdom. Amen. And if yesterday wasn't that day, today is that day. Amen. And I'm, I'm here for it, God. It's so easy to say, yes, I believe in the Lord, but hard to live for him without the right guidance and discipline. I accepted God as my savior when I was nine years old, but as I matured into a teenager, I didn't want anything to do with God. I asked myself, how could a loving God let me struggle while feeling so alone? I'm 24 now, but I walked through most of my life angry, sad, and confused. I was lost because I didn't know the key to life. You could have lived in poverty, raised in a broken home like mine. You could have turned to sex, drugs, and alcohol because that was the only thing you thought to numb the pain of living. Maybe you were like me asking God to die, cursing God and attempting to kill yourself because you couldn't take another day. It doesn't matter whether you made too many mistakes or have been victim to other people's mistakes. We are all human and the key that we all need, whether rich or poor, is Jesus. See, see, this very same Jesus saw me in my despair. He died on the cross for my sins so I wouldn't have to hold on to that shame. Brothers and sisters, he changed me. I no longer crave death. I no longer hold on to the past. My hope, my, my hope is in our God. He is the only and one true God. He is a living God. He resurrected from the dead on the, he resurrected from the death on the cross so we can have new life in him. There is victory in Jesus. He wants to change our ways. He wants to lead us, his children, in this wicked world. I cling to Jesus because he gives me hope. He gives hope for a better future. I have hope for eternity. For now, my salvation is sealed and my name is on the book of life. We, we are only here for a moment and gone in the next. Think of those who aren't here anymore. I challenge each and every one of you to take up your cross and follow Jesus. I am getting baptized because I no longer am the same person who I was. I want to follow the Lord and fulfill my purpose in this life. After you accept the Lord as your Savior, the discipline in what I'm learning is to pray at all times. Read your Bible every day to learn of God and His ways and develop a relationship with Him. We have to obey His commands and live this way. He will change our life. We have to do this if we want to go to heaven. We have to do this, and I know it's hard, but would you rather give the demons praise by destroying yourself and your family? Or give yourself and your family a chance, a real chance? Giving our lives to Jesus is the best decision we can make in our life. I give up everything and I take up my cross. Glory be to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one true God, the living God. Amen. Hallelujah, the one true God. And 
lift up. If you would for a moment, extend your hands out so we can pray for them together. Father, we pray in the matchless name of Jesus that you would empower them with your spirit, that you would encourage their faith and their journey, God, that you would give them faith, you would give them encouragement in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray, God, that they would experience you in a way that they've not ever experienced you, God. Show yourself to be real to them, God. Show up in their lives that they've never known it before so they would know without a shadow of a doubt that you and you alone are real. You are their Savior and you are their Lord. In Jesus' name we pray because we believe it. Amen. Amen. Build your church. Come on. 
open and available for you to build your church we thank you Lord for those people who just got baptized that made the decision that they will be open to be built to be what you called the church to be we thank you Lord for what you've done for us this morning may we find gratitude every day and build us Lord take out of us whatever is not like you Purify us. Let us have clean hands and pure hearts, Jesus. We worship you, God, and we bless your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we give the Lord some praise? Hallelujah. You're worthy, Jesus. You're worthy, Jesus. Why don't you turn to your neighbor next to you, behind you, on the side of you, and tell him, I will be his church. And when you're done with that, take a look at the screen for a couple messages. Good morning and welcome to Anthem Church. Whether you're in the building or watching online, we are so glad that you chose to join us this morning. Our mission here at Anthem Church is really simple. 
We are leading people to know Christ and to make him known. One easy way you can help us do that is to share this stream or check in on Facebook and let people know that you're here. If you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe so you can stay connected. Anthem Church, I need your help. Let's welcome our first time guests. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. We want to stay connected with you. In the seat back in front of you, there's a QR code that you can scan or a connection card that you can fill out. Either way, in about 45 minutes, meet us out in the lobby at our first time guest table so we can say hi and get to know you. We also have a free gift for you and some Anthem merch as well. If it's your first time watching online, there's a link in the comments that we can connect with you as well. Again, welcome to Anthem. It's offering time, let's make some noise. There are two ways that you can give. If you have cash or a check, there's an envelope in front of you that you can use. Just drop it in the offering containers as you leave the service. If you want to give online, you could do that at weareanthemchurch.com forward slash give. I want to say thank you to everyone who has donated so far to our backpack giveaway in our partnership with Kenwood Elementary. We've raised $5,800 so far, and this is the last week you can help to give. If you would like to give, you can do that at weareanthemchurch.com forward slash give and click the backpack option in the drop down box. If you'd like to give cash or a check, just write backpack on your offering envelope and drop it in the container as you leave as well. We're excited for this opportunity to be the hands and the feet of Jesus to our community. While you're getting your offering together, there are two things that I want to tell you about. Our first week of 21 days of prayer has been phenomenal, and we know it's only going to get better. Everybody say this Friday, this Friday is Anthem Night. It's a night of prayer and worship, and you don't want to miss it. Doors open at 6.30, service starts at 7. Secondly, today after service, we are having our Team Expo. We know that you have been looking for a place to use your gifts and talents here at Anthem, and this is the perfect place to start. Team Expo is an opportunity to check out every team here at Anthem and find the best place for you to belong. You'll be able to get the information you need, sign up on the spot, and even get a treat in the meantime. Again, this is happening right after service, and we can't wait to see you out there. Well, that's all I got. Now it's time for the word. Pastor Sam is up next for our first week in our brand new series, Grit. Well, good morning, Anthem. How y'all doing today? How many guys are excited to be in the house of the Lord? How many guys know it's a great day to be alive? Anybody excited to be here today? Anybody? I see a couple excited people in the house. I don't know about you. Excited for the word of God today. Excited for what God is doing. Can you guys make some noise for all those people who just went down in the waters of baptism today? So amazing. So amazing. Thank you for your obedience. And I don't know about you. We're all touched by your testimonies today and what God is doing. Amen. Well, if you don't know, if you're new here, can we welcome all our first-time guests one more time this morning? We can do better than that. Come on and make some noise. If you're a first-time guest, you raise your hand. Any first-time guests in the house today? Uh, we are so excited you're here. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, we're excited you're here. And one more time, if you're our first-time guest, we'd love to meet you after service. It's going to be done in about 45-ish minutes, depending on how long I preach. Um, <laughs> but we would love uh, to meet you. If you are new here, my name is Sam, my wife, Taylor, and I have the wonderful honor and privilege of serving is your lead pastors, and we're excited that you're with us today. Uh, today kind of starts, um, I would say, the, the mark of a new season, I believe, for us. Um, not only is it back to school, anybody excited for back to school? Any parents? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> school's back to school, um, and, and kind of, I believe we're kind of entering into a new, new season as a church, and so with that, I'm kicking off a new uh, collection of talks today, as Pastor Rob mentioned in that, in that video called Grit. Somebody say Grit. Um, we're going to be talking about this, this trait uh, of grit, a, a biblical trait that, that I believe um, maybe some believers are lacking in these days. And so here's what I believe God is doing in and through his people in this hour is I believe God is moving us from being a crowd to an army. Um, you know, a crowd can't fight the gates of hell. An army can. And I believe God is moving us from, how many of you guys know salvation is amazing? I believe God wants to move, move us from salvation to lordship. Um, and so over the next four to five weeks, um, I'm going to challenge myself. I want to challenge you. Where's all the believers at in the house? Um, if you're a new believer, you're going to get the gospel and plenty of it. But I want to talk to you um, over the next four to five weeks about uh, this trait called grit because I don't want you to stop short for what God wants to do in your life on this earth. It's one thing to be saved. It's another thing to be useful in the kingdom. And that's what we're going to be talking about over the next few weeks. And so what 
what is grit? There's a couple things you need to know about grit. Number one, all, all the Bible readers, this is my 9, my 9 a.m. crowd, so you guys are looking at me like, well, grit's not in the Bible. Um, and you, you would be right because the word grit is not in the Bible. However, the word grit is seen all throughout Scripture. It, it's, it's seen in words like endurance, perseverance, long suffering. <laughs> and so you got to understand that even though you don't see the word grit in Scripture directly, what is grit? You see it all throughout Scripture in the form of these different biblical traits. Now, here's the other thing you need to know about grit before we dive in. I just want to lay a quick foundation about this thing called grit. Here, here's kind of what, um, let me give you some good news and some bad news. Here's the good news. When, when you look at uh, the greats of faith from Jacob to Esther to Peter all the way to Paul, even in modern day, anybody know somebody you would say is a great saint of God? Um, I, I was studying them and looking at them and I found one thing they all have in common. And here's the good news. It's not some uh, natural gift they're born with. Instead, they all contain something I would call biblical grit. That they keep on going. It's not something they were born with. It's something that they grow into over time and it's developed. And this is the good news is that you might not be born with it, but all of us have the same opportunity to grow in it together. Um, and so it's not something we inherently have, but it's something we grow into. So that's the good news is if you don't have it, come on, you can get it. But here's the, the not so good news is how God seems to develop it in his people. God develops grit all throughout scripture with one word called adversity, trials, tribulations, because God knows something about you that you know about you that growth and comfort don't really go well together. So God will remove some comfort and drop you in a situation to grow you to see what really is on the inside of you. And so that's what I want to talk about for the next four to five weeks. Anybody going to show up? <laughs> and on the other side of the camera, you're going to say, I'm going to be here. And I'm, I'm excited to dive in. So if you have a Bible, if you could turn with me. To Genesis chapter 32. Genesis chapter 32. What we're going to be doing, well, you're finding the address there. Um, if you don't know where Genesis is at, it's the first one. Genesis, I want to look at 32. While well, you're finding that, here's what we're going to be doing over the next four or five weeks. See how long God takes us on this journey together. Um, as God is making us strong as a people, I believe. Is I want to look at some different gritty characters of the Bible. And so the first one I, I want to look at today is a, a guy named Jacob. Somebody say Jacob. Jacob. I'm going to look at Jacob. If you guys could stand in honor of the reading of God's word. I've been wanting to preach this text for about seven years. And I finally got to it. Genesis 32, 22 through 32. Uh, this is the word of the Lord. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It says this, during the night, Jacob got up and took his two wives. Not a good idea, but... Um, We'll deal with that one day. His two servants and his 11 sons and crossed the Jabbok River with them. After taking them to the other side, he sent over all his possessions. This left Jacob all alone in the camp, and a man came and wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. When the man saw that he would not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of its socket. Then the man said, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. What's your name, the man asked. He replied, Jacob. Your name will no longer be Jacob, the man told him. From now on, you'll be called Israel. Because you have fought with God and with men and have won. Please tell me your name, Jacob said. Why do you want to know my name, the man replied. Then he blessed Jacob there. Jacob named the place Peniel, which means face of God. For he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been spared. The sun was rising as Jacob left Peniel, and he was limping because of the injury to his hip. Even today, the people of Israel don't eat the tendon near the hip socket because of what happened that night. When the man strained the tendon of Jacob's hip. Uh, today from this wonderfully juicy narrative in the Old Testament, I want to share with you under a question. You guys got to help me. I know you don't like to talk to your neighbor, but you got to talk to your neighbor, okay? Look at your neighbor and help him with, with my sermon title. It's a question. Look at him and say, why are you limping? Look at your second choice. Say, you too. Why, why are you limping too? Why are you limping too? Come on, type that in the chat on the other side of the camera. Why are you limping? Can we pray together? Lord, you don't have to repeat with me. Lord, you can if you want to. 
Grow us to be more like you. Amen. Y'all may be seated in the presence of the Lord. The year was 2011. The songs Party Rock and Firework by Katy Perry were on the top of the Billboard list. Bin Laden had just finally been found. Steve Jobs unfortunately passed away. And Taylor and myself were just getting our feet wet in ministry. We were the volunteer youth directors. Thanks for that, Deidre. One person like that. Uh, <laughs> or Sean. That was you, Sean. We were the volunteer youth directors at a church called Christian Life Center in Tinley Park, Illinois. We had been volunteers, youth directors now for close to two years. In all transparency, we had absolutely no idea what we were doing, but we are still experiencing a move of God. How many of you guys know your knowledge and experience is not a prerequisite for God moving through your life? Uh, the ministry was growing somehow. Our leadership team was expanding, and it, it was pretty amazing. And in this season, in 2011, a special guest came to Christian Life Center named Prophet Bill Hammond. Any, anybody who grew up in different circles, you might know the name Prophet Bill Hammond. For those, though, who knew me and know me a little bit, know that I grew up in a traditional church environment that did not teach or practice uh, the gifts of the Spirit. So we are rather new to the gifts of the Holy Spirit at this time in our life, and we're still getting an understanding of what the gifts of the Spirit were all about. And so when I heard the word prophet in front of a guy's name, I was like, skip this. What is going on here? You know, like I'm not too interested in what this person has to say. But since we are on the volunteer staff at this point, I received an email from Pastor Jerry McQuay. Shout out to Pastor Jerry. Love you, Pastor Jerry. And he, he emailed us and said, hey, since you're on staff now, um, I wanted to be like, but you ain't paying me. But I was on volunteer staff at that time. And he said, since you're on staff, um, we're having all the staff and leaders come over to our house for a time of prophetic ministry with the prophet who's coming in town. And I was like, well, this should be interesting. But Taylor and I were a little bit skeptical because we're like, we've never experienced this before. So a bunch of leaders were there, and I was sweating. I looked at Taylor. She's sweating because we never experienced this before. And we didn't know this about Prophet Bill Hammond, but if you know church, you understand that Prophet Bill Hammond is not just any prophet. He's the prophet of prophets. Like, this dude has been doing this for decades. And, and so he's prophesying. It's going well. And finally, it's our turn to get prophesied over. He sits us down in the middle of Pastor Jerry and Pastor Chris's foyer. Everybody surrounding us still have a, a recording of that time. And we sat down, and I don't know about you, but I still don't know what to do sometimes when people give me a prophetic word. I'm like, do I look at them? Do I close my eyes? Do I open my eyes? Do I put my eyes down? Are my hands up? Are they closed? I don't know if I'm receiving what you're saying, so my arms are still crossed, you know, so I don't know what to do. And so the man starts prophesying over us, and as, as the saints say sometimes, he, he read our mail. Uh, we are running from the Lord. I was running from my calling. And he prophesied over us a lot of things that we're walking in today, that we would be ordained, that I would be preaching, that Taylor would be doing different things, that we would be seeing people delivered, healed, and set free, that even in our ministry, people would be baptized, all these different things that we even experienced this morning. And we left there kind of excited. Even towards the end, he, he spoke to a place that God was going to take us a, a rank in the kingdom at the end of our lives. And when he said that, I said, you got the wrong person. We got in the car Super excited that night for what we believe God was going to do through us, but we missed something of the utmost importance. We missed that he actually spoke to the process God was going to take us in order to get to where God wanted us to go. And I listened to this a lot of times, and I, I actually wanted to just share that he, he shared this over us. I, I, I missed it. He, he, he said this, God's going to take you here, but this is the process God is going to use to get you there. He said, God is removing the dirt from your foundation and replacing it with the steel and cement God is expanding what you've limited yourselves in, and God is getting ready to take you through a process like David to broaden and deepen your foundation. And I'm like, huh, a process like David. Wasn't it David? Who was developed in a cave in a dark room before he ever got to a castle? In other words, what he was saying was God was digging us up. God was getting ready to put us in a cave. But it was in that season of our lives, and that word came to pass that lasted for a good five years that I learned a little bit about who God really is, not while I was in a castle, while I was in a dark room, in a cave. And I found in my life, you probably know this too, I didn't really get to know God on the mountaintop. I got to know who he really was in the valley. And I learned this season, in this season, a powerful biblical principle 
And some of you guys, I, I get it, you're going to tune me out real quick, and, 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 and I get it. It's actually one of my concerns in church right now is that we've developed a palette for only the sweet things of God. And it's kind of one of my issues now with Internet Church, and I love you on the other side of the camera. I know some of you are very committed to watch this every single week. I'm not really talking to you, but it's kind of my issue these days when you got your favorite celebrity TV pastor is that you can change the channel when you don't like the message. And sometimes I think we've developed a taste for only sweet things to God, but I'm telling you, you don't grow with only sugar. You need some meat. You need some things that grow you. Put some things on your bones. And it was in the season that I learned what I, I don't believe is Christianity 101. That's Jesus is my Savior. I learned about Christianity 201, 301. Jesus is the Lord of my life, the strength of my salvation. And here's what I learned, and it's next level biblical principle. Maybe somebody could give me a shout even though it hurts. It's through pain that you give birth to your purpose. Uh, all the ladies shouted because you've given birth, some of you, so you understand there is no birth without some pain in childbirth. But I learned in this cave of life where God was developing us, it's through pain that you give birth to your purpose. I like the way that author Sam, uh, Pastor Samuel Chan says this, and, and you guys know this, the higher you go, the greater pain you have to learn to endure. He says this, you only grow to the threshold of your pain. And I want to show this to you today from our text. Because our text is a case study in this principle about pain. Now, I'm going to do something I've never done before because um, I want to wrestle with something in this text. And I thought, they're wrestling, right? So I'm going to wrestle. I want to give you three uh, things that are going to kind of mess with us a little bit about God this morning. Three things that are a little uncomfortable about God. Three things that when you look at them, it's kind of like, God, why do you work this way? Yes. So I want to I wrestle with some, some disturbing truths yes. about God. How many of you guys want to wrestle in the text this morning with Jacob? Yes. Here's, some, here's some tough truths about God. Let me give you three from this text. Here's, here's the first disturbing truth about our God, something to wrestle with. That God's pathway to kingdom usefulness requires a road called brokenness. God's pathway to kingdom usefulness requires a road called brokenness. In other words, brokenness is often the road God uses to break through. And you guys know this, but God cannot fully use you until God breaks you. I knew it was going to be quiet in here today, so I'm ready. I'm just ready. I'm going to respond to myself. In our text for the day, let me show it to you in the Bible in Genesis chapter 32. We see the second spiritual encounter of Jacob's life. The first encounter, Bible readers, you might know, is in Genesis chapter 28 at a place called Bethel. The second encounter is in Genesis 32, which we see here in a place called Jabbok. At Bethel, Jacob saw a ladder. At Jabbok, Jacob saw the Lord. At Bethel, Jacob became a believer. At Jabbok, Jacob was broken. At Bethel, Jacob became a son. At Jabbok, Jacob became a saint. At Bethel, Jacob died to his sins. At Jabbok, Jacob died to himself. At, at, at Bethel, Jacob, if you know the Bible, he left with a leap in his step. At Jabbok, he left limping for the rest of his life. In every person under the sound of my voice today, you need a Bethel experience. Bethel is where Jacob met God. Bethel is where you meet God. That's what Jacob said about Bethel, that surely the Lord is in this place. Can anybody here recall today your Bethel experience where God came and found you dead in your sin and knocked on the door of your heart and said, I want your life. We should know the time and the hour where I met God, where God came to me. Every believer needs a Bethel experience. Uh, Bethel will get you to heaven. But likewise, every believer here needs not only a Bethel experience, we need a Jabbok experience as well. Because Bethel will get you ready for heaven. Jabbok will get you fit for ministry here on this earth. And I said it a few weeks ago, let me say it again. There's a difference between being saved in his kingdom and being useful for his kingdom on this earth. So you might be saved. How many people are saved? How many of you are, like, happy and you know it, you know you're saved, you know? <laughs> like, but can I just say this? Jesus is Savior is level one. But until you submit to the Lordship of Christ, you won't be overly useful in his kingdom. You can be saved and not useful. 
And some people here today, I knew it was going to be a little quiet. Because you can't fully praise God on this point because you haven't been broken yet. I'm going to say this gently, but you still got too much of yourself. You still got some money in the bank and you think you got it because you earned it. You have the job you dreamed of because you think you're strong and worked your way into it. You still have a nice house and a nice car that you think it's because of how good you are. But there's some of us here today that can celebrate that here's the thing. I know I only met God at Bethel. I met my God at Jabbok. And it wasn't until I met God at Jabbok and he broke me until I realized I thought I had everything I want, but I never realized I never had what I really needed. It wasn't until God broke me I realized just how weak I was and how strong he was. It wasn't until I was in the valley and he pulled me out. And I get it today. It's why some of you can't praise God like that yet. But instead of thinking I'm crazy, maybe it's just better to say, maybe you just don't know God like that yet. Because for me, I just can't help to praise him. Because everything he's brought me through. But this is a little uncomfortable truth about God. Can we give God a shout of praise right now just because he's so good? You got to get this. It's at your back where you really get to know God. You never know who you really are until you face trouble. You, you never know if your faith is real until you get a no. I'm trying to pace myself a little bit. I'm going to pause real quick. It's how I know if people are really submitted. Everybody's cool until you got to tell them no. And then you find out. Are you really here or are you not? <laughs> I said, it's really cool until you got to tell somebody no. And that's when you find out. Am I, am I telling the truth? That's how I know if my son really is listening to me or not. When I tell him no, are you going to listen or not? It's a hard truth today. Brokenness is God's requirement for maximum usefulness on this earth. God can't fully use you until God breaks you. How long, now check this out. Uh, this is for the next generation coming up. You got to get this. How long was it between Bethel and Jabbok? 21 years. Because it takes God a moment to save you, but a lifetime to build you for usefulness. 21 years go by. 21 years. It takes 21 years to build a strong preacher. It takes 21 years to build a strong disciple. It takes 21 years to build a strong prophet, somebody being used by God. It takes time for God to work in you and build you. Charles Spurgeon says it this way. I find it powerful. He's my favorite preacher. He says, whenever God means to make a man great, he always breaks him to pieces first. Martin Lloyd-Jones, one of my other favorites, he says, you always be broken before you're ever made whole. You guys know this too. The greater the anointing, the greater the crushing. And we, we know this, right? You don't get oil without a crushing of grapes. We, we, you got to get crushed before you got some oil on your life. And God, I'm not saying God causes everything. Hear me today. I'm not saying God causes everything. But I am saying this. God has a way of using every broken place, every ratchet decision, every bad thing that's happened to you. God has a way of working it all together for the good of those who love him. And God will never waste a hurt in your life. God will never waste a thing in your life. So if you're going through it, God can use it. But, but I'm telling you, what, what we see, that God's pathway to kingdom usefulness requires a road called brokenness. And, and this is disturbing. Is it not? We're shouting because God broke us, but we're out of the breaking. That's why we're shouting now. Some of you can't shout yet because you're being broke right now. And, and it's disturbing. So I, I want to go to the next disturbing truth about God because um, it gets more disturbing to me in this text. It's going to get worse before it gets better. Um, let, me, let me tell you why, okay? So this is the first truth. Here's the second truth that you see in this text. Because I'm like, God, why do you break us? What, what kind of God is this? Why would you do this? Come on, let's wrestle. Here's number two. God also uses strategic times of isolation to work on your transformation. That when God wants to do surgery on you, God will isolate you and get you all alone. It's no different than... Uh, when if you're so, with somebody that has to go into surgery, you can be in the waiting room. You can be in the room with them 
until there's time to go. But when they go, you have to be, they have to be with the doctor alone so he can put the hands where it needs to go. God, this is what he does when he's going to do surgery on you, when God wants to heal some things in you, when God wants to work on you. God will isolate you and work on you where it's only you and him together. Where do I see this in the text? We see it in, in, in verse 24. Now, I, I want to show you, though, how do we get here? Because um, it, it's interesting. Context is really important here because you've got to understand, why is Jacob at Jabbok? Here's what happens. Um, if you guys know the Bible, Jacob... Um, his name actually means swind uh, it means deceiver. Uh, it's, a it's a story for another day. Um, his parents called him deceiver. Wow. You, you can't go through life with a label slapped on you from birth and not be broken like that. You know what I mean? His parents, he's a supplanter. That's what it means. He's a heel grabber. He's a, he's a trickster. And he actually lived out to the label that was put on his life. Can I ask you, what labels are you living out that God never put on you? And so he's living out to this label that his parents put on him. And so what do you see his whole life? He's a trickster. He's a deceiver. Well, here's what happened. He tricked his brother Esau and stole not only his blessing, he stole his brother's birthright. And his brother got so sick and tired of him, he said, I'm going to kill you. So Jacob left, and he was gone for 20 years at his, a place called Laban, at his Uncle Laban's house. Even there he had trouble. He thought he was marrying Rachel. How... How much did he drink at his birthday or at his wedding? <laughs> he wakes up the next day and realizes not her. <laughs> like, wait, you're not Rachel. <laughs> but what you reap, you always sow. He was reaping destruction. He's sowing destruction. He reaped destruction. And so what you see now, he finally, after 20 years, is going to meet up with his brother Esau. And he's scared. He's about to meet him, and here's what happens. He sends some people out, and they're about to go see his brother, and his brother says, he doesn't know what his brother says. All he knows is his brother sends 400 troops back to go see him. He thinks, my brother's going to take me out. So he's hiding, and he goes to a river called Jabbok, and he sends his family and possessions to the other side. And in verse 24, what do you see? That Jacob was very much all alone. And until Jacob was alone, God couldn't do the surgery he needed to do on Jacob's heart. And, and you got to understand this, when God really wants to deal with you, he'll, I, there, there are seasons of isolation he'll put you in. And here's the problem with that. We live in a time and culture where people have a hard time being alone. We're always connected. There's always noise. People can always get a hold of us. You can't even have a meal. I'm preaching to myself. Take a walk. Exercise without being connected, without taking a selfie and putting on the gram and pausing in between reps to see how many likes you got. We always have something on, TV, ear pods, a, a Bluetooth speaker. Why? Because could it be deep down we're afraid of the noise of silence because when there's no other noise, you're stuck with you and God. Because when you're all alone, you got to sit back and deal with you. But how can you know the plans of God when you never listen to the God to begin with that knows the plans? Jeremiah 29 and 11, the problem's not what the plans God has for you. The problem is this, your, your life is so noisy, you don't know the plans. It's in the silence where we can hear what God is saying. You may have a favorite preacher, a speaker, a podcast. But I want to remind you today, I don't care who the preacher is on this earth, ain't nobody can talk to you like God can talk to you. Only the one who created you can fulfill you. Only the one who built you understands how to build you back up and speak to you in the broken places in your life. Jacob's left all alone. And when God got him alone, Jacob had to come face to face, not only with God, but himself. And being alone with you and God in just a silence, can we talk about it? It could be a terrifying place to be. Because God knows how to ask you a question that you can't get out of. Now, you guys know this. We say it a lot, but you know it already. Anytime God asks you a question, you guys fill in the blank. He's not looking for information. Why did the Almighty God ask people questions? Obviously, he knows the answer. So when God asks you a question, Jacob, what's your name? It wasn't that God didn't know who he was. Now, what you need to understand in this text, at this point, Jacob didn't know who God was. I'm going to get to that in a minute. He thought he was wrestling his brother, I think, because it's dark out. He didn't know yet that he was actually who he was wrestling. 
And what you see in this text is really interesting. Was something called a theophany, okay? Can, can we talk about it real quick? Jacob's all alone. When God gets him alone, he's, he's just here wrestling. And it gets to the heart of the matter what happens. What happens here, it's a theophany. It's a disturbing truth about God, okay? Now, what we have here is what most Bible scholars believe. Jesus comes down from heaven, dresses himself up, is, is a man before he comes, and he comes to earth, okay? It's a, it's a manifestation of God before Jesus comes, a, a theophany. Now, picture this, okay? Because sometimes I read right past this. I read this text so many times that I read right past it. The Bible says it's dark out. God shows up. You want to talk about disturbing truths about God. This is the scene in Genesis 32. Jacob is on the side of a river. God comes down from heaven, shows up at earth. It's pitch black outside. He looks at Jacob, probably woke him up and said, let's wrestle. Can you picture that real quick? You're sleeping and somebody's leaning over you. Let's wrestle. And Jacob didn't even do anything. What did he do for God to pick a fight with him? Some of you are in that place in your life. Like, what did I do where God all of a sudden just shows up out of nowhere and he's pressing on some things in my life? What happens? Who hasn't been here? God, why am I dealing with this? So God says, let's fight. <laughs> Is this not the Bible? It's right here. And in verse 27, when he gets them all alone, God, we're going to get this up on the screen so you can see it. God asks him a question. God says, what's your name? In Jacob, here's what you got to understand about your name. Your name brings up your history. When somebody asks your name, it brings up your history. So he said, my name is Jacob. And when he said, my name is Jacob, here's what I think happened. He's all alone, just him and God, him in the silence, and he's forced to come to grips with who he really is. That he had to come to grips that since his birth, he was a liar. He was a trickster. He was a deceiver. He, he, he even learned how to change the color of sheep to steal from his uncle. And he had to deal with all these things he had done his whole entire life. And when he said, my name is Jacob, Jacob had done a lot of things. And he is face to face with himself. And he has to look in the mirror. And at that moment, God has him right where he wants him, where he has to acknowledge not only who he really is, but who he is not. And God is saying, I need for you to be the real you right where you're at. I need you to be honest with you. God says, Jacob, what's your name? You've become so good at deceiving others, now you're deceiving you. And you guys know this, the worst lies you tell are the lies you tell yourself. And here's the issue with Jacob and with a lot of people. Jacob has a great calling but not great character. And God says, I need to deal with that. Amen. And many times, God simply needs to remind you and admit who you are so God can make you into something new. But if you're faking it all the time, God can never deal with it. And until we admit who we are, God can't develop us into what we're supposed to be. Amen. So I want to ask you a question today. What's your name? <laughs> your name brings up your history. Your name brings up who you really are. And can we be honest today? Like, can I, can I be honest with you guys? I, I'm sick of play church. If I see one more Instagram clip about somebody catching the Holy Ghost that I knew is rehearsed, I'm going to lose it. Because we can shout and sing, but we don't change. And until we admit who we really are, God can't deal with who you're faking. Can I tell you something today? Who really are you? I'll be honest with you. There's a Jacob in me too that I need to deal with. I'm a sinner. I've fallen. I've deceived people. You've got to be real with you too. Be honest. Like the, the you that showed up here is not the you that woke up this morning. You, you put some things on. I met a man this week. He was wearing man Spanx. He tucked some things in. covered some things up. But I wanted to remind you that God can't minister to your mask. Uh, let me say it another way. God can't anoint your metaverse avatar. This is how fickle our world has become. 
that we go into virtual reality because we don't want to deal with our brokenness. We don't want to bring it to God. So I put on some goggles because I can get something in a moment that will take God a lifetime to build. What's your name? Come out of hiding. Can I tell you, God can deal with your addiction. Oh, I feel the freedom about to hit this room. God can deal with your sinfulness. God can deal with your lust. God can deal with your pain. God can deal with your adultery. God can deal with it all. But you got to admit that it's in you before God can take it out of you. What's your name? Sometimes I feel like Paul. I know what I want to do, but I don't do what I know I'm supposed to do. Is there anybody else here? You got to deal with it. Sometimes I feel like I'm double-minded in my own spirit. I got faith on Monday, but I'm broken on Tuesday. I got to let the God know sometimes. What's your name? What's your name? What's your name? When God wants to do surgery in your heart, God gets you all alone and looks at you and says, I need to know who you really are. And it's when God finally gets to where he... He says, I'm Jacob. This is the most disturbing truth now in the text because this is where it gets really crazy. And I just want to remind you of something. Uh, just one more thing on this whole idea. You got to come in a little close for this one. God has x-ray vision. God sees what you try to hide. You, you can hide stuff from your wife, you can hide stuff from your counselor, but you can't hide stuff from Jesus. And until you bring it to light, God can't get rid of it. What's your name? Sooner or later, some of you are going to burn yourself out trying to keep up a public perception that's not the real you to begin with. There, there's a lot of people that are burning, I'm going to talk about this, a lot of people that are burning, grinding. Where there's oil, there is no grinding. My engine doesn't grind when I got oil in it. You, you got to stay in your place of grace, but grace is not on things that are fake. Number three, God is willing to dislocate your hip so he can touch your heart. Man, this is disturbing. It's right in the text. God is willing to dislocate your hip so he can touch your heart. All right, Jacob and God are wrestling. Jacob still doesn't know it's God. Here's what the text says. Can I read the text one more time? Verse 24. This left Jacob all alone in camp. A man comes, wrestles with him until the dawn began to break. When the man saw that he would not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of socket. Then the man said, let me go for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. Jacob here is wrestling with God. They're wrestling for hours. At first glance, it's a little confusing in this text. When you write, really look at it, um, I used to think like, well, why couldn't God defeat Jacob? He's God. But don't get it twisted. It's not that God couldn't defeat Jacob. It's that he chose not to. And a lot of times we celebrate what God has done. Can we celebrate what God chose not to do in our lives sometimes? You know what I mean? Like, I'm thankful that God chose not to kill me when I deserved it. Don't, don't get it twisted. It's not that God couldn't defeat him. I'm going to show you in a minute. It's that he chose not to because he wanted to do something in his life. You see, it wasn't that they were having, having a match. God was having a moment. They're wrestling. And God realizes something, though, about Jacob. He realizes, man... This dude's kind of gritty. He's not going to tap out. He's going to keep going. And so when God realizes Jacob's not going to tap out, he's like, this is kind of a problem. Because if the sun comes up, Bible readers, you know, nobody can see God face to face and live. So the sun's starting to break. I got to get back to heaven so he's going to die. It's not his time yet. So now there's kind of this problem. So what does God do? This is a new side of God here. They're fighting. Jacob won't give up. This is a disturbing truth about God. God breaks Jacob's hip in a fight that God started. And how does he do it? Like this, boop. That's all it took. One finger, I think. In the moment, this is the moment I realized that Jacob realizes who he's wrestling with. 
Because one touch from God will change your life. And the Lord breaks his hip. Now, I did some study on this because I'm like, okay, what, what, what did this look like? This sounds nasty. And I found this really interesting. The hip in Jewish culture is a reference to the thigh, the quadricep. It's where the strength of a man or woman lies. It's one of the strongest muscles in your body. And God broke him where he thought he was the strongest. God deals with where Jacob thinks he's strong to reveal where he's actually very weak. God deals with him there because God has a way to touch you in a place where you're finding false security in your life until it's taken away. God will handicap where you think you're strong to reveal where you're actually weak. Why? So you change the source of your strength. The thing that you think is giving you a leg up on your blessing. Can we talk about it? Jacob thought his strength was in he was a deceiver. God is saying, I need to do a work in your life because I need to take away the fake blessing to give you a real one. And I'm telling you, what is it in your life that you find your strength in? Your false sense of strength. For me, it's my work ethic. I'll be honest with you. I think I can outwork everybody. I'm going to work my way into right standing with people. But I'm telling you, all it took for me was to get COVID. <laughs> Sitting at home for a week and realize that I'm not that strong. Amen. And can I tell you why I think a lot of people uh, in this last season, if you look around, a lot of people are walking away from the Lord. Amen. It's because they don't understand how God works. They met him at Bethel, but they left him in Jabbok because they weren't willing to get broken. When God was saying, you've, you've relied in things for so long, but I need to take them away so you understand that I am really God and I'm strong where you're weak. Like what we see here is Jacob is actually saying that what Paul said, in my weakness, he is made strong. He is exalted. And God knew the way to Jacob's heart was the dislocation of the area that Jacob thought made him strong. And to get to Jacob's heart, God was seemingly okay breaking his hip. Have you ever had your life put out of joint by God? Oh God. Oh God. Hey, has God ever dislocated your dream? Sometimes God has to touch you in a place where all the fight is gone. Um, I wasn't planning on doing this, but I'm going to do it. i got a couple minutes left to spare. Derek, Derek, come here real quick. All right, for sake of this analogy, I'm going to be Jacob. Don't let this get to your head. Derek is going to be God, okay? <laughs> now watch how this works. This was um, something that I saw in the text I'd never seen before because um, a wrestler, where do they get their strength from? Their legs. Um, it's something interesting in the text. The verb changes. It says wrestle, and then all of a sudden Jacob is holding on. Some of you missed it. It starts as a wrestling match. What started as a fight ended up in a hug. Why is it? Because we're wrestling, right? We're wrestling now. Now he breaks my hip. Now all I can do, all I can do, all I can do is hold on. And, and here's what I think I missed my whole life. Is that I thought Jacob was always like God. I'm not going to let you go till you bless me. I thought he was fronting on God, but I think he realized this. God, I can't let go of you until you bless me. I can't walk with you, and I can't talk with you. I need to hold on to you. And it was in the moment of his greatest pain where he realized, I can't let go of you. I've never felt more safer than in the arms of my father. It was in this moment with God. Because you can't have somebody like a father tell you you're a deceiver and not have it break you. You can't have people tell you you're a trickster and a liar your whole life and be okay. But in the moment of the arm of the father, when Jacob was finally in the hands of God, after he broke his hip and said, I don't have anything without you. He said, I'm not leaving until you bless me. I can't live without the blessing of my father. And God gave him a new identity. And this is what God does. 
He went from I was a deceiver to now I'm fathered by God and I'm a son. And he says here, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. And here's what God says to him. You want a blessing? Here's what it is. Your name is no longer going to be Jacob. Your name is now Israel. The prince. They called you deceiver. But you don't have to be what they call you. Now you can be who I called you. They called you deceiver. I'm calling you prince. An overcomer. God's going to break some labels off your life today. In his arms. And is this not what God does all throughout scripture? Hey, Abram, I'm going to call you Abraham. I'm going to call you Father of Nations. Hey, hey, Saul, I'm going to call you Paul. God is constantly giving us new identities. The biggest blessing is life is a new identity, not in the world, but in him. And this is what God does. And it's a disturbing truth. But the areas where you find a false sense of security in, God is willing to break your hip to get to your heart. And some of you today, you feel the pain of the breaking. And how do you know when God has broken you? Can I tell you why? Here's what I found out in the cave when I knew I was finally broke. It's because I was running in the wrong way. And I knew I was broke when I finally stopped fighting and started holding on. That's how you know God got you where he wants you finally. It's when you're in the arms of God, he breaks something in you, and all you can do is hold on to him for dear life. And God says, finally, I got you where I want you. Now I can really bless you to take you where I'm taking you. And Jacob leaves this place. And the Bible says he calls it Peniel, and he names it something new. And he goes forth from this place, and it's really interesting, is that Jacob walked with a limp for the rest of his life. Uh, what was the title of my sermon? Why are you limping? I have to think that he walked up to Esau the next day or the day after like this. And his brother, who he thought was going to kill him, that's a story for another day, actually, they, they embrace. His brother had to look at him and say, why are you limping? And Jacob's only answer, he could no longer deceive. He could no longer trick. He's saying, I'm limping. Because I wrestled with God, and he touched me, and my life has forever changed. And then for the rest of his life, you read about it in the Hall of Faith in Hebrews 11, chapter 11. Jacob is listed. You know what he's listed as? He was leaning on his walking stick. Why are you limping at the end of your life? Because God touched me. I'm never going to be the same. And you might not be walking with the physical limp in this place today. But can I tell you what your limp is? It's your testimony. You know, I'm not walking with a physical limp, but here's the thing. You, what you guys might not know about me, I got some limps. Is there anybody here who's limping? I got a testimony that God has done in my life. Yes, God broke me, but yes, now God has blessed me. And then he put his brand on me, and the brand is a limp, so people know everywhere I go. I have veins that come out of my chest right here because I almost died of a blood clot. I was baptizing somebody and barely could get them out of the water because my arm was so swollen. I was diagnosed with a rare blood disorder, but God healed me. And I got scars to prove it. You can't see the scar on the inside of me that's on my heart, but how many of you can guarantee you got one on your heart too? The moments where my heart was broken when I thought we were going to adopt a child and he was with us for three months, and he was taken out of our home unjustly. And we put oil on that kid's head. And I set him apart for the work of God. And I put him in a car seat. And I walked him out the door. And put him in a car. And I was stuck all alone in my driveway. Just me and God. And I said, devil... There's something you need to know. There is nothing you can do to me that I'm going to stop following God. 
And now I got the scars to prove it. Because God put me back together. So many of us, we want to hide our limp. We want to hide our scars. Oh, but your scars are beautiful. People need to know your testimony. Not the edited version. What's your name? I've been preaching about Jacob the whole time, but Jacob is just the picture of one who's come in greater name, Jesus. Jesus is the perfect Jacob. And Jesus the Christ was beaten on his back. He was hung on the old rugged cross. And they put nails in his hands and his feet. And they wrapped him up in mummy clothes and put him in the middle of the earth in a cave. And God went down in flesh, down into hell, took the keys from the devil and defeated him. And came back up and rose from the grave and appeared to 500 people. How did they know who he was? His disciples said, prove to me who you are. And Jesus said, look at the stripes on my back. Look at the holes in my hands. These scars saved your life. These scars set you free. And I don't know about you, I'm still walking with the limp today and I'm gonna show everybody in my scars that I was a sinner and God set me free. I was dead and God raised me back to life. I didn't know where to go and I'm gonna keep on limping because God put me back together. Is there anybody here today say, why are you limping? Because God healed me, he saved me, he delivered me. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Can I give you one more thing? I was going to do it whether you said yes or no. I was confused about one thing and I'm done, okay? This is my one and only close. I've already had three of them. This is my fourth. I was really confused in the text because God gave Jacob a new name. Now, anytime God gives somebody a new name, that's what they go by. Abram was always called what? Abraham. Saul was never called Paul, or, you know, never, Paul was never called Saul again. Peter wasn't really called Simon, which by the way, you guys know Simon's name actually meant water. God said, I'm actually gonna make you a rock. But they never went back to their old names. It's really interesting though with Jacob. People called him Jacob sometimes and Israel other times for the rest of his life. And if you fast forward to the end of the story, it's really interesting, Jacob dies. He's gone for, for years now and God raises up one named Moses. It's really interesting. And, and Moses is intimidated. You guys know the text is Exodus chapter three. Moses intimidated, he's going to talk to Pharaoh. You guys know, Exodus 3 and 14. Moses says, well, who should I tell him sent me? Right? And we'll get this up on the screen because I, I want you to see it. Exodus 3 and 14. God replied to Moses, tell him I am who I am. <laughs> Say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. Uh, but sometimes we stop at 14. We preach on the I am. Let me, let me get to 15. God also says to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham. Uh, Abraham means the father of nations. The God of Isaac means that God rejoice. You know, that's the name. And the God of Israel. And don't say that. No, he says, I'm the God of Abraham. I'm the God of Isaac. And I'm the God of the trickster. I'm the God of the deceiver. I'm the God of your bad side. I'm the God of your broken side. I'm not just the God of the fathers. I'm the God of the orphan. I'm the God of the misfit. And God wants you to know he's just not with you when you're good. He's with you when you're bad. He says, I'm the God of the sinner. I'm the God of those who left me. I'm still the God. That's what God wants us to know today. Why doesn't it say the God of Israel? God must be trying to say something because he wants us to know he's the God of all people from all backgrounds, all ages. And God wants all of you. And if you could stand to your feet, I want to pray and we're done. Why are you limping? If you could, if you're okay, I'm not going to do anything weird, but if you knew you're not to this, I'm just going to ask. If you guys could just lift your hands, here's why. I know we're in a room full of people. You might be on the other side of the camera. But if you're here today, 
uh, this journey of persevering and enduring starts by admitting to God who you really are, not who you wish you were. And if you guys could just have a moment with, the, with God right now, and I want to pray for perseverance in a moment. But I'm telling you, um, I, I think we need to close this gap in between who we pretend to be and who we really are. And if you're here today and just say, man, God, like, I, I just want you to have all of me, whatever that place is. I was having a moment with God just this morning. Just There's some areas in my life I'm tired of fighting. And I said to tell God, I'm weak here. I need you, Lord. Whatever that is for you, you can just have a moment with the Lord, just 30 seconds to a minute. Now, church, what I want to do is just pray. One thing I love about Jacob is that he was persevering. I want to pray for you to keep on going and not stop short for what God is doing. If I could just pray over you, Lord, right now. The Lord says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden. I'll give you rest, for my yoke is easy. God, I pray. Galatians 6 and 9. Over our church, over us as a people. Lord, let us be the kind of people who don't grow weary in well-doing. For, Lord, we know you're true to your word, and we're going to reap a harvest if we don't give up, if we faint not. And, Lord, I pray for perseverance to fall over us. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you wake us up early with divine energy, even us who are getting a little older in this place, Lord. Lord, I thank you even depression is fleeing right now, Lord, and you're giving us joy and peace to keep on going. And, Lord, I pray that it's be said about us, Lord, even at the end of days, Lord, there were a people here who walked into everything that you called us to do. Lord, help us not to quit early. Help us not to abort what you're doing in our hearts too early because we don't want to keep going. Lord, build perseverance in your sons and daughters, and we'll be careful to give you all the praise and glory and adoration in this place. And I hear the Lord saying, some of you, even right now, you don't even know what to pray for in perseverance because you stop chasing anything in your life. And I hear the Lord saying, this is an hour where you need to seek me in the quiet place and I'm going to speak to you. Don't be afraid to me. Get alone with me and let me talk to you. Lord, I pray that you impart dreams into your people. We love you, Lord, and we lift you up and we give you all the praise and glory and adoration in this place. Pastor Rob is coming. We give God a big shout of praise in the house today as he comes to close us out. Amen. Amen. How many of you guys just feel like you just ate like a big, huge tomahawk steak? Man, I'm just so full. Such an incredible word. You know what? Let me, I'm going to get you out of here in a couple minutes. Uh, let me give you some quick next steps. All right. So check this out. We know that you love to bless people. Raise your hand if you love to bless people. Amen. Because of you, you got get to bless 280 students at Kenwood Elementary that are going to be starting school, be able to bless them with a backpack full of every single thing they need. But we're not going to stop there. Everyone say this Saturday, this Saturday. 9 a.m. We're going to put the icing on the cake. You get to bless them by making sure that their school is beautified and looking sharp, looking good for this year. So this Saturday at 9 a.m., you have an incredible opportunity to meet here, and then we're going to head just right down the street to Kenwood Elementary School, and you guys get to bless them just beautifying their, their grounds, re-putting some mulch, just making it look nice. So again, say, this Saturday, 9 a.m., Show up for our 219 event for that. That's going to be great. And then also, at right after service, you've been sitting here wondering, how can I get involved? How can I find a team? You're going to go outside the doors, and you're going to see right on our grassy area that there are tents set up. We literally have every team in Anthem represented, every ministry team, for you guys to get involved. And we want to make sure that you find the right spot. So there's some snacks out there. As you go, you can ask some questions uh, and, and sign up on the spot for a team. And then also, if you're here today and you said yes to Jesus, or maybe you even have some questions of what does it mean to serve Christ, in the very back of the room, uh, you'll see there's a sign that said, I said yes to Jesus. Meet us back there. We'd love to pray with you, let you know what your next steps are. And last but not least, can we make some noise one more time for our first time guests? Thank you so much for being with us. 
right outside these doors. We want to meet you guys, give you some free and some anthem merch. And how many of you guys want to leave with a blessing? If you can, lift up your hands. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord show his favor and give you his peace. And everyone said amen. 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 You guys be blessed. Thank you.